Psalm 73. As you make your way there, we'll go to the Lord once again in prayer. Dear God, we come this morning, we're so thankful for the many blessings you've given us, for allowing us the opportunity to come to your word. Uh, we do so very humbly, uh, very submissive, and, and understanding that, uh, that there is really nothing good within us, and that there is nothing that we could come to your word in a critical sense, that, that we cannot come to your word to correct it. We, we ought not to come to your word to uh, and seek to justify our actions that would contradict it. The Lord asked that we would just be open and, and honest before you and, and open and honest with ourselves. And I understand it can be very difficult to be honest with ourselves that we look past our faults so easily, uh, understanding our, our what we think to be our own intent. Uh, but God, may we not do that this morning, that, that we would look to your word and, and really be humiliated before you, uh, that we could be corrected. Uh, we are so thankful that your, your word is able to do such. And, and Lord, we ask that for those that would be lost, that they especially would come humbly before you in understanding that, uh, that they have no claim to eternal life, that, that they sit as it stands now under the wrath of God for all of eternity, uh, but that you have done the work to where it does not have to be that way, that you have... Uh, purchase their salvation you you have paid for their redemption you've atoned for their sins and you offer them salvation freely uh by by grace through faith uh, that you have made it to be so simple please help them to understand just how simple but yet how wonderful and incredible and powerful a work that the work of salvation is and for those of us who are saved lord we thank you for that great salvation and we ask that you would help us that we may lay hold on eternal life that, that we may uh, make the, the most of it, that, that we would use the Holy Spirit that you have given us and uh, that we'd be molded and changed to be a, a church that is pleasing and acceptable to you, that we'd grow up and nourished in your word and continue to be nourished. Uh, Lord, I ask that you'd help me as I'd stand. Uh, there, I stand. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is nothing of my own ability that I can do. I've got no ability to convince anyone of anything or to teach anyone anything but that your word does. And I ask that that would be accomplished this morning according to your will, not according to my own might or ability, which I have none. I'm so thankful for the, the, uh, the reliance that, that we can have upon the Holy Spirit. It's in your wonderful and holy name we pray if you're so worthy. Amen. Psalm 73. We're just going to read a couple of verses here, beginning in verse 16. It says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I therein. Uh, for those that have uh, that stick around for the afternoon service, you know that we're in our Malachi study, and, and recently we've come across some verses that really uh, coincide with Psalm 73. And for those unfamiliar with Psalm 73, the premise, the thing that he is so uh, that he would speak of in verse 16 that is too painful for him to understand is why the wicked prosper and, and the righteous don't. That he would look to those godless people, those people that have no concern, and he would go on to describe them leading up, uh, that they set their mouth against God, that there is just nothing in them that desires to please God, and yet that they're perfect, that, or not perfect, but they're perfectly set up, it seems, that there is no problems that they would have, uh, that everything is going good for them, they prosper. And uh, again, the priests in Malachi that were uh, speaking harsh words against God, that they were saying the very same things, that they were saying that the wicked are set up, that, uh, that it is vain to serve God. And for a moment that Asaph is kind of uh, going right along that same line of thought that, that uh, for, for he, as far as he's concerned, uh, that he is diligently trying to serve the Lord. Now, there's a difference between Asaph and the priest in Malachi. Asaph was actually serving the Lord. Uh, that Asaph was actually used in, in, uh, of the Lord and, and submissive before him. But in Asaph's mind, that, that, that he has humbled himself before God, he's trying to serve, and it just seems like he's just getting chastened for everything. That, that every misstep, at every, every, at every turn, that he would just veer outside of the will of God, that he is sorely punished for it. But he would look to those in open rebellion towards God and everything's going fine. And, and that, that there, it comes to this point in which he's so troubled by this. And it says, that, and that's where we'd come to in verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. And now this morning, I don't want to belabor the, the, the point of Psalm 73. Uh, I think we're, we, we've spent a lot of time covering it in Malachi, and I certainly don't want to continue to harp on it, but rather to take a more generalized view of this psalm, to take a, a zoomed out view, if you will, 
of what's going on and, and, and to try to apply it across a, a wider variety of, of contexts, some of the contexts that we would find ourselves in, that it is often, that, or it may be often, that, that there is something that you would come across, some issue, some trial, whatever it may be, that you come across in your life in which verse 16 sounds uh, like something you could really sign your name under. Uh, that there, there, there might just be this some perplexing thing going on, and we're going to look at several examples throughout the morning, Lord willing, uh, of people that were, are really faced with some sort of issue, some sort of perplexing thing that is going on that just has them so troubled, so confused, and that the very thought of trying to understand it would be too painful for them, that this is not an uncommon thing. Now, the issue, the, the thing that, that, that really just gets us stuck in, in these mindsets, the things that would really bog us down and cause many actually to turn away, many to grow so discouraged that they are done altogether, is that we are really, we, our focus is, is all out of whack. Our focus often that, that we would think that for this issue, and, and this, is, this is how we, uh, even naturally speaking, that, that we find this to be true, that, that if you... Uh, for, for those that are, are, are at home working on something or whatever it might be that uh, you just cannot figure out how to put two and two together. There's this one little tiny issue and you cannot get that, that little issue to go together. Where you're putting, I've used the example of putting furniture together. You might be stuck on one little part and you just cannot figure out how to go forward. And, and finally, whenever you kind of zoom out, the things start to, to make sense. Whenever you divert your focus from that, that then pieces begin to fall into place. And, and this would be what would happen with, with Asaph, that, that his issue uh, was that he was so centered, so focused in on this problem that in his mind, if I could sort out this problem, then I, I will be okay. If I can remedy this situation, then I will be content. But really, what he was focusing on wasn't even the issue. It wasn't even the problem. Again, we, I, I've used this example, and it's, I use it because I don't think I've ever put furniture together right the first time, uh, that, that so often we think we have come across one issue, but really the issue is, is uh, way further back, that the issue is totally different than that one step that we might be stuck on. It was that we forgot to do this other step first. We forgot, the, we, we forgot to put this screw here or whatever it might be. Uh, but for Asaph, that, that he was so hyper-focused on this one issue. We so often foolishly meditate on our, our specific problem to try to come up with some sort of remedy. And in Asaph's situation, again, he was looking at the wicked prospering and, and him being chastened. And for, for what, what occupied the entirety of his mind, was the wicked and Asaph, that that was the center of Asaph's universe for a moment. Uh, that, that we place, and, and we likewise, we place ourselves at the very center all the time. And, and for, for good reason, that you live life through nobody's perspective but your own. You don't live life through my life, that, that you don't uh, live your life from my point of view, you live life from your point of view. And from your point of view, everything goes on around you. It, it, we just can't help but to think this way. We live our life and everything else revolves around us in a sense. And this, there, there's a, a great issue with this. There is great reason that this brings us confusion because from our point of view, life revolves around us, but life has nothing to do with us. Life goes on whether we're here or not. Uh, that, that for me being born or not being born, that, that there are certain things that would be affected, sure, but life would march on. The sun would rise in the morning. Uh, whether I wake up tomorrow or not, life is going to carry on. Like I said, there might there, there'll be a, a group of people that it affects and it changes things a, a lot uh, for them, but for, for the most part, the, the life doesn't revolve around me. Life doesn't hinge upon me. Life centers and all of creation centers around the Creator. That was the point that it was made for. That the Creator has put all things together. The Creator is supposed to be the center of life. And whenever we stick ourselves right there, it really begins to skew our reality. There was a, an example that I'd come across. I think it was a, an example that, that Spurgeon had, had used uh, actually regarding these verses in this psalm. Uh, that he would use the example of the solar system. 
And for, for us, and, and actually this caused a lot of confusion in science hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of years ago, uh, that for, for in their minds, you know, that the, the earth was the sensor of everything that they saw. And so the, the, the earth was what the sun would revolve around. The earth was what the moon would revolve around. And uh, the earth was what the planets would revolve around. And, and, and I guess one of them, they were right, the, the, the moon that they had pegged out pretty good. But, uh, but that this, in their mind, the earth was the, the center of everything. But as they began to uh, map out the way that these stars would work, as they began to map out the way these planets work, if, if you know anything of, of any amount of physics, you'd understand that, that if you go and you look at Saturn, Saturn doesn't revolve around Earth. And if you thought it did, you'd be sorely confused as you watch it and map it out throughout the sky that obviously it's not really interacting with us, but rather it's interacting with that which is at the center of the solar system. It, it is reacting and, and revolving around the sun. And for us to think that this whole, all of these things would revolve around this planet that I sit on and you look out, you'd be scratching your head a whole lot. You would be very perplexed, but to understand that it revolves around something else, to shift your focus to something else, that which it actually revolves around, everything begins to make sense. It all begins to fall in place. And we must not place ourselves at the center of this life. You must not place yourself at the center of your problems and, and your confusions. Things don't make sense this way. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Now, in Hebrews 11, a very famous chapter of Scripture, uh, often called the, the heroes of faith, or, or it, several different nicknames it's given. Uh, but the chapter does pretty much exactly that. It lists out a whole bunch of people that showed faith, and it points out their faith, and it makes an example of their faith. Now, the, the point wouldn't be to lift them up. Actually, it goes on in chapter 12, the point being that we have all these witnesses, we, we have all these people that have shown faith, and so now I need to show faith, not in them, but in the object of their faith, that they showed faith in God, and it gets to chapter 12, and it reveals, well, I need to show faith in God likewise. But in Hebrews chapter 11, it's a very impactful chapter. It's very influential. And imagine for a moment that the people listed in this chapter uh, had uh, the same sort of mentality that you had, that they are the center of everything, uh, that we would find... And they would often grow severely discouraged and would quite honestly not really make the list here. But we'll start reading here in Hebrews 11 and in verse 32. That it would say, and, and what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped to the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And there's a colon. And before we get past that colon that is there, uh, we'll talk about what leads up to this. See, the, the thing that would so often skew our perception of what a child of God is supposed to receive, what a walk with God is supposed to look like, the benefits that are supposed to come along with it, is we would take a look at this list and we would see the, these list of things and we say, well, that sounds really good to me. I want to be like those. I want to be like the ones who subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lies. It did, uh, everything started sort of falling into place for these people. Things started to work out for them. Uh, that we can turn and, and, and your, your mind goes to story after story after story after story where there was this problem, the problem rose up, and then God solved the problem and delivered them. That our minds go uh, to the likes of David, that whenever he would face Goliath, that there would be this problem, David would be faithful, God would bless. That your mind would go to the three Hebrews in, in, in Daniel chapter 3 
and that they would not bend the knee to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, statue that he had built, and that they had chose rather to be cast into the fiery furnace, and the Lord delivered them. Your minds may go uh, to the widow woman with Elijah, to the, the ones uh, over in the, in the New Testament that, uh, that they would come to Christ and they would have these issues and Christ would resolve those issues that we see so many miracles that would take place in Scripture that we fail to understand that those are exactly that. They're miracles. Even by the standard of that day, they were miracles. By the definition of a miracle, it's not common. It's not usual. It's not the usual outcome. And so for, there, there would be many, yes, that would have these results, but the list continues on. In verse 35, after it would say women received their dead, raised to life again, it would say, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, <clears throat> were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins being destitute, afflicted, tormented, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. That as we look to this list, a me-centered reality, a, a life that revolves around me, if I were to put myself, again, <clears throat> with this wrong point of view, the point of view that Asaph was originally coming with, if I were to stick my shoes over or stick myself over in the shoes of, say, Gideon or of, of David, for instance, that if I were to go and put my feet right in the shoes of David, that I, that, that would be good. Yeah, David suffered more hardship than, than most of us would ever see, but David was continually delivered. Yeah, he fled for his life, but the Lord constantly would, would, would bless David, that he would constantly deliver him, and that sounds like somebody that shows faith. David gets in a problem, David has faith in God, God delivers. And if I were to take myself and go and stick myself over in the shoes of these others that it talks about who were stones on asunder, tempted, that in my mind, well, that, well they, they weren't faithful. In my mind, well, David was more faithful than them because David received a better outcome. Imagine if these people had the same mindset. Imagine if there were those that had given their literal lives. They had not just in a moment, not just in a moment of death, but throughout their entire lives because they had wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves. They had lived destitute for the furtherance of the redemptive work of God. Imagine if these people had crossed their arms and began to pout because that person over there had it better than I had it because that person over there was delivered and I was not. From God, from the judgment of God for what he has declared is not that David was treated better because he was more faithful. It says these all having obtained a good report through faith. That it would get to those list of people that, that had really did not get the, bent, the, the outcome that we would want. And it would say of them of whom the world was not worthy. That is how God felt about these people. Not that they, well, I would have helped them out, but. But it, it, rather it would say the world was not worthy of these individuals. So why is it that they were treated so harshly? Why is it that they come to such an unfortunate end? Well, the reason is because life didn't center around them. Just as life didn't center around David, just as life didn't center around Moses or Abraham or uh, Abel of all of these people, life didn't center around any of them. As a matter of fact, even leading up to these passages of Scripture, we have, uh, we have Abraham, and, and we see a good outcome with Abraham. He received the promised child. He was given these promises. He was blessed. He was very wealthy. We also see Abel killed by his brother. Uh, the two don't really go together, but it speaks of both of them the same, that they obtained a good report through faith. You see, we cannot take on this idea that Asaph took on. We can't take on the idea that they take on over in the book of Malachi, uh, of which that, that we look, and I look from my point of view, and I look to my problems, and because my problems aren't being fixed, well, God is not just. That because I, because maybe, maybe you don't think that. Because maybe you look and say, because my problems are not fixed, I'm doing something wrong. That's not necessarily true either. 
that really what we need to look at is, sure, my problems might not be fixed, but that's okay because this life doesn't revolve around me. It revolves around God. These issues that whenever we have the wrong point of view, they take, it takes on an intolerable pain. That's why Asaph would say in verse 16 that when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. But verse 17 really turns the psalm around. It would say, until I went into the sanctuary of God. That would be when things began to change. And again, you see, look at Asaph and what it is he's focusing on. He has all these issues. Up through verse 16, you will not find, outside of verse 1, verse 1 is positive. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of a clean heart. And it's positive because he's just stating the truth. From then on, but as for me, it it was all negative. Every bit, verse 2 all the way through verse 16, it's all horribly negative. And then something changes in verse 17. Up to verse 16, his focus, again, outside of verse 1, because he's really starting with the the conclusion almost, outside of verse 1, verses 2 through 16, everything that he talks about is the wicked and Asaph, the wicked and Asaph. And yes, he mentions God in there, but he only mentions God because he's confused by God's character. That is all the focus. That occupies everything. How is it that the wicked are messing up? Well, he lets you know exactly what they're doing. He lets you know all the ways that they're messing up. And then he looks to himself and he lets you know that, well, he's not doing these things, but he's being punished. And then there is a new focus. There's something different. It's not about Asaph anymore. He doesn't go on in verse 17 and speak about Asaph. He goes on in verse 17 and says, Then I went into the sanctuary of God. And there are those that suggest a lot of things of this verse. That they come, that they would come to this verse and they say, Well, Asaph went uh, to the, the, the sanctuary, he went to the temple and he saw uh, the, the fire that burned continually. Or maybe he saw that, that uh, 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 kind of representing of the offerings that would be offered. Maybe he went in and he saw these offerings take place and he's reminded, Well, God's just and there's a penalty for sin and there's a coming judgment. Uh, that they might go and that they would suggest, well, uh, you know, maybe he saw the veil and he's reminded of the holiness of God or, or all of these different things. Maybe he heard the law being taught. And, he's re- and sure, these things may have happened, but really ultimately what took place is that his perspective changed. What ultimately took place, even in those words, the sanctuary of God. Now, it may have been that he did literally go into the sanctuary. He may have literally went to the the, the temple and saw these things. But really, the sanctuary of God is that where God dwells. That he would go and to be in the presence of God, whether this be in a literal sense in a building or or in a spiritual sense, the outcomes are, are really the same. That for us, in a similar mind frame of mind is, is Asaph. That where is, what is it that I must do? Must I go and resolve the solution? Must I go and try to understand that which I've struggled so much to understand? No. I need to go and to be in the presence of the Lord. That, and we'll, we'll get on this later. I, I, I'm not of the opinion that, that Asaph went and opened up the law and read of judgment and said, oh, there's the answer to my question. I don't think he was seeking an answer anymore. I think finally he had stopped seeking an answer and simply sought God himself, sought to be in his very presence. Um, And that ultimately is what worship is. That those things that we had talked about, maybe while he, he was seeking God, He heard the truth taught of the coming judgment and the just nature of God and his holiness. Maybe all of that did happen, but it only ever happened because he was in God's presence. He only ever got any sort of answer, any sort of reprieve because he was in God's presence. He only ever got any sort of comfort because he was in God's presence. There are some side effects. There are some results that come from being in the presence of God, but they never come until we go to the presence of God. Yet the the scriptures are true. 
They provide in wonderful counsel and guidance. They light our, that's why the, the psalm would say, and uh, we use it in the, the Pledge to the Bible, that it, uh, it is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That is exactly what God's Word accomplishes for us. It goes and it gives us instruction. That, that uh, I, I was thinking earlier of, of, of the New Testament. Uh, and so so much, and, and, and there, there are many uh preachers that would focus so heavily on, on uh, everything that they ever talk about being about salvation and, and maybe that's the ministry they're called to but but as we look at the nature of the word of god very little of the new testament is evangelistic certainly a lot of it speaks of salvation it speaks of how to be saved but if it, the reason that the books of, of romans and uh, first and second Corinthians, first and second Thessalonians, the Timothys, the, 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 the Colossians, Philippians, all of those letters, that's what they were. They were letters written to churches of people already saved to give instruction. God's word is great for these things. It teaches us perfectly. But how am I supposed to receive such teaching outside of the presence of God? Even just the words themselves. No, that it would speak, God's word speaks of how that his word is spiritually discerned. It wouldn't make a, a difference to me in the world. Uh, th- those words on those pages outside of the Holy Spirit that teaches me those words, that teaches me the truth and the reality of these things, outside of God's presence, none of the other things matter. It's not as simple as, and it gets very difficult to talk about the word of, uh, of God in a sense because it's not like other works. There's this unique. There's nothing else like it. That if I was confused of, uh, about a, a question of biology, I could go and seek biological books and, and, and learn of some of those things. If I had a problem with math, if I didn't know how to subtract, I could go and read how to subtract and just information alone would be good enough. But whenever it comes to the word of God, that it is a spiritual work. It's a spiritual understanding. And until I seek not just answers, but until I seek God himself, I can never understand anything. I can never find this reprieve that Asaph found. We have, I said we look at some examples. We'll look at some examples. Turn uh, the book of Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> Begin reading in, in verse 51. But, um, I'll save you some time and not read everything up to here, but, but we'll certainly kind of let you know what it is that he talks about, that uh, Stephen would stand before Jews and, and he would uh, start and, and speak of uh, Abraham, and he'd start with Abraham, and he would, in pretty good detail, lay out Abraham's life and, and move on to Moses' life and the Exodus and coming out. Uh, and, and he would go through and speak of the, uh, the 40 years in the wilderness, and uh, he would speak of this God of their ancestors, and that's kind of what he's getting his mind on. Uh, and, and he would lay out, and he would get all the way up to the point here, uh, and, and around verse, I think, 40, of which Aaron would go and, and uh, uh, let's see, in verse 41, in which Aaron would go and make that calf, and they would turn from them. And, and as he's going through these people, through this timeline, he, is, he would make mention of these people who were faithful. And he would make mention of those then, that would betray those being faithful, the vast majority of these people. And he would go on, actually, and, and uh, he, he would go and he makes mention of uh, verse, 47, or verse 47, he'd make mention of Solomon. And prior to this, he'd make mention of David. That He would go through and outline some of these people who were uh, very faithful. But the vast majority of God's chosen people were, would constantly betray them. They would constantly not heed their words, constantly seek their destruction. And so he, that's where he'd get in verse 51, or we'll pick up reading. And he would say that, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist 
the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Now understand, uh, you, you can look down at your, your Bible, and, and he begins in verse 2. That's whenever Stephen starts speaking. And from verse 2 down to verse 50, and those are pretty long verses, he outlines to them all of these examples that their forefathers and their ancestors had betrayed truth. And he would say, you're stiff-necked, you're uncircumcised in heart and ears, ears, and you're doing the exact same thing. As your fathers did, so do ye. It says, verse 52, which of the prophets have your fathers, I'm sorry, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by dispensation of angels and have not kept it. And he, he then challenges them after all this, please give me one prophet that your fathers didn't seek to kill. Give me one prophet that your fathers thought they're speaking truth. That's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on board with that. And so he lays out this long history of how that everybody was exactly like them. They thought they were doing good, but they constantly betrayed those who were actually good. And this has a result. It says in verse 54, When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. When he had said this, he fell asleep. That would mean that he died. And so for this example, again, the, the context of what's going on, Stephen is not being mean. Stephen's not trying to poke fun. He's not trying to rile this crowd up. Understand the context of what is going on. Why is it that God ever sent those prophets to begin with? Because God loved this group of people. God set aside this group of people, and God made a covenant with them that was conditional upon the way they reacted. God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham, and then he would go on with Moses and lay forth a conditional covenant that if they would heed the judgments, if they would heed the instructions, if they would heed to the law, that they would be God's people and God would be their God. That there would be a right uh, union with them, that things would be uh, just fine and, and dandy, that the Lord desired to pour out blessing upon them, but it was conditional upon their obedience, and they were being disobedient. And so God, instead of choosing to destroy them, he would send the prophets and want them to come back. God would want them to return. And we come here to the New Testament, and Christ himself would come. Just as all those prophets after prophet after prophet had come, and Christ had come and laid forth, and uh, the, he would give that offer to be their king, and they would reject that. And then he would die, and he gives forth this offer for them to, again, in his long-suffering and merciful nature, that he gives an opportunity for them to repent and to be saved. That is the goal. That is what Stephen is trying to accomplish. That is what God wants to happen. God wants this people to repent. God is being merciful with this message. Stephen, yes, his words are harsh, but his words had to be harsh because the reality was harsh. Stephen comes, and he's not poking fun. He sees this multitude of people, and he wants them to repent and to return. He wants them to have eternal life. That is his heart. That is his desire. And the people stone him. That's God's desire. That's the will of God. God had set aside Stephen for this purpose. And God would allow him to be stoned and allow him to be killed. And instead of sitting there and crying out, God, why are you letting this happen to me? I'm just doing what you wanted me to do. And, think, and I'm literally losing my life. Instead of having this attitude, instead of Stephen putting himself at the center, that his desire then was for those other people. His desire was God's desire. Again, God desired, he doesn't desire that any perish, but that all 
would have eternal life. That's what God wants. He made, he purchased salvation for all. He offers salvation to all because all need it. Because all are born into this world under sin. Uh, that would be our very nature. And so God wants that for all to be saved. Instead of Stephen getting so self-centered and so, and I, it's, it's funny to say self-centered. For us, it wouldn't be all that unreasonable for Stephen to ask God, hey, do you mind if I live through this? Do you mind if I not die doing what you want me to do? But instead of taking that perspective, that point of view, it was his desire for God to be merciful to the very people that were killing him. It was his desire that God's people be given another opportunity for salvation. That was ultimately what he would want. He didn't have the me-centered reality. He had a God-centered focus and reality. In understanding Stephen understood, I'm not at the center of this universe. God is. And what God desires and wants is far more important than my own comfort or outcome. And he was content with that, to suffer far more than what we ever really would. Very similarly, you could uh, go to Jeremiah. Uh, If anybody had a right to get all upset, it would be Jeremiah. That he uh, Similarly, he was one of those prophets that was coming. And and some of the ways that Jeremiah speaks in the book of Jeremiah, you may think that he's bitter towards those people. But as you get to the book of Lamentations, that he would also write in which God's judgment would come, he isn't rejoicing over their destruction. He isn't all happy that things uh, went south for them. He isn't happy that really, in a sense, Jeremiah could have considered that revenge. If you read the book of Jeremiah, the people of God were so harsh to Jeremiah. Not one time do we see somebody that would listen. As a matter of fact, God would use Jeremiah to bring a letter to the king, and the king would read off a portion of it, and cut that part of it, and throw it in the fire, and he would go on, and read the next portion of it, and cut that piece off, and and he would go through the entire prophecy, and the entire word that God delivered to that king, and he delivered that word to that king, that the king might repent and prosper. That it, that, and instead of looking in the book of Lamentations, instead of uh, seeing all the judgment that would unfold, things that historically, if you're wondering, things did not end well with that king. Uh, he, he suffered greatly. God really poured out judgment upon him. And instead of skipping and dancing throughout the street, the Jeremiah would lament that God's people had to suffer. Because God didn't want God's people to suffer. Jeremiah didn't want God's people to suffer. Jeremiah wasn't the center of Jeremiah's universe. God was. We go and, and, and we certainly we could spend all day. Job would come to mind. As you read the book of Job, a lot of perplexing things happen to Job, a lot of hardship, and a lot of things that Job never understood. And as you look at the end of the book, you might think, well, Job comes to this grand conclusion uh, and he understands exactly why everything happened. He doesn't. All that God explains to him at the end of the book is, Job, who are you? Compared to me, he would go through all those questions. Where were you when I formed the earth? Uh, Can you draw out Leviathan with the hook? Uh, Can you array yourself in glory like I can? Can you do this or that or the other? And and he would go on and on and on. And all God is revealing to Job is that, Job, I'm I'm bigger than you, and you just need to trust me. And that that was good enough for Job. Job stopped being the center of his universe, and God started to. Last example I'll look at be the example of Paul, book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verse 18. Saying, And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews. And how that I kept nothing, how that I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, in faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that, that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure before the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. And so what we, what we read here uh, is Paul gathering together some elders at Ephesus. And the reason he gathers together elders at Ephesus is that Paul is going to die. Uh, there would be a course of a few years before he would die, but those years would be imprisonment and imprisonment and imprisonment. And, and we find that, that it, right after this he would go in uh, amongst the Jews, be arrested and shipped off to Spain ultimately where he would die. And so he gathers these people together, understanding. He says, I don't know the thing. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's waiting on me. What I do know is the Holy Spirit has testified in every city that, that chains await me. And then he goes on and he explains in verse 24, uh, not in verse 24, uh, in verse 24, uh, that he is, it says, but these things, sorry, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He'd go on again a little further down and say that, uh, again, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I know I, y'all won't see me anymore. This will be the last time we ever meet. That he knows his life is coming to an end. And the reason we started reading all the way back in verse 18 is we see Paul's account. What is it that Paul had done? He's been faithful. That's it. And he would go on and, and, and say, I have kept back nothing from you that was profitable. I have done, really what he's saying is, I have done exactly what God has wanted me to do. I've said the things he wanted me to say, gone the places I needed to go, taught you the things you need to be taught, testified both to the Jews and the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So I've done it all. And not boasting, but just laying out the fact that he has followed the will of God perfectly. And what is ultimately going to happen? What, what is Paul rewarded with on this earth for his faithfulness? Chains and death. That, that's it. And he would even make that statement, I don't even count my own life dear unto me. Why is it that that was his mentality? Whenever so often we would look to God, just as Asaph was, God, I've been faithful to you, and things are just going so much better to, for them. That As you read on the book of Acts, that he would appear before some people that were living a pretty good life. He would appear before Agrippa and Felix and Bernice and, and all of them that were in exalted positions. They were in royal positions. And, and things were going great for them, but they were godless people. As you begin to study some of the history of some of those folks, that, that quite, quite godless people, horrible people. Things were going great. And meanwhile, Paul is in the middle of all of them, bound and fixing to go to his death. Boy, Paul could have had the mentality of Asaph, but he didn't. Again, he understood that God is the center of all of life, of all of creation. And it is for God that I go bound to these people. It is for the sake of his gospel that I go to be killed. And I'm okay with that because life doesn't revolve around me. Short example, we'll look at Christ because even Christ would have this same exact mentality. That remember, he would say on this earth, I come not to do my own will, but the will of he who sent me. He comes to do the Father's will. And the Father's will would ultimately cost him his own life. This is the exa these are the examples that we have been given. These are the, 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 this is the focus and the mindset that a child of God is to have. Whenever things are going great, thank God they're going great. Whenever things aren't, I don't have to squabble and complain because things are rough for me. Rather, I can understand that God is the center. It is only whenever we shift our focus that we would find reprieve. Again, I don't think it was that Agrippa went and he looked back and he, he saw the future destruction of the wicked and he said, oh, there we go. But rather that he became so overwhelmed. He said it was too painful for him. He would become so overwhelmed and simply seek God. 
And being in the presence of God, then an answer would come. Then a little bit of reprieve would come. After he would shift his focus, then he would begin to understand why it is the way it was. Why the wicked prospered and why he didn't. And then he would be content. As a matter of fact, uh, he would be a little bit more content than content, he would go on and actually begin to regret that he had ever had those thoughts, that he would speak of how that he was as a beast before God, that he was so limited in understanding, that he was, he says, so foolish and I am ignorant, I was as a beast before thee, that he would begin to repent of ever having those thoughts, that that is how clear his mind became as he would go to the presence and the sanctuary of God. Turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, and we'll close. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Again, very familiar scriptures. I'm in 1 Corinthians. I need to be in 2 Corinthians. Thankfully, I noticed before I started reading that time. 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 7. It says, Unless I should be exhausted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that, he, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And so what we would have would be Paul with this thorn in the flesh. Thankfully, very vague expression. That which was really really bothering him bothering him so much that he remember this is the very same one who had written i don't even count my own life dear unto me it would be intense to the point at which paul would go and seek three times that this whatever it is would be fixed and god's answer uh he, it was of course my grace is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness and for a long time that i would read that as this, this very uh, beautiful way of saying sure i'll fix it but really it's a very beautiful way of saying, no, I won't. I won't fix it. That we might sum it up that, that Paul pleads and pleads and pleads, God, please remove this thorn from me. And God says, no, I won't. Thankfully, he provides an explanation. My grace is sufficient. My, not, not sufficient to remove the thorn. The thorn was sticking. His grace was sufficient to persevere through the thorn. His grace was sufficient to continue to faithfully serve God even though things weren't going the way he wanted to, even though there was pretty severe suffering on behalf of Paul that was taking place. Even though that was happening, God's grace is sufficient for him to continue on in this life. Why? And he would even go on, and upon realizing this, that he would say, I take pleasure. And I don't think that he was, a lot of times that, that uh, you know, there are a lot of pithy statements that go on, uh, you know, too, too blessed to be stressed in which somebody's all stressed out about something, and it's a little bit sarcastic. I'm just I'm too blessed to be stressed. We, we have all these little statements that we say, but a lot of times we don't even really mean it. Uh, this isn't what Paul's doing. Pa Paul's not giving out this, and, and don't get me wrong, we ought to be too blessed to be stressed, but uh, sometimes life is just stressful. Uh, so, but, but that's not what Paul's getting at. He's not giving out some pithy statement. He's not lying. He says, I take pleasure and infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, on behalf of Christ. If, if it can be used, in other words, what he's saying is I'm not at the center of, of my life. Christ is at the center of my life. And if the things that are happening to me, even though they might be absolutely horrible, if these things can accomplish his will, if these things can further his purpose, his gospel, if these things can contribute to his kingdom, I take pleasure in the fact that I can be made weak, that he can be made strong. And it would be my prayer and my desire this morning that we would adopt the very same 
mentality, that we may learn to worship the center of this universe, of all of creation, and to view life from his throne, so to speak, that we would begin to look at circumstances from his point of view to accomplish his work. This would be the message. We'll offer a verse of invitation.